Please welcome to the stage Ron Klain, White House Chief of Staff, and Franklin Four, a staff writer with The Atlantic. Hi, Ron. Hi, Frank. How are you? Good. Honored to have, I just learned, Ron, uh, David Frum's law school classmate Yes, here. David and I were in uh, law school together, first year, small section. Uh, and how was he as a student? We don't need to go there. Yeah. Um, that's not how I'm going to uh, waste my time with the uh, <laughs> what has chief of staff. I w today is uh, the first day of, of fall, I think, and you described uh, the summer as a season of substance, yeah. which is a title I think I'm going to appropriate for my um, next anthology of poetry. Um, okay. Not sure. <laughs> it's yeah. like the the the, the it was the more prose than poetry, but sure, yeah. yeah. So I just want to look back at kind of uh, the, the pieces of legislation that have just passed yeah. and to get your sense of how they add up. Because sometimes in kind of the messiness of the legislative process and the fact that every it's been so uncertain kind of what would go through and what wouldn't, it's hard to remember if there was actually a theory behind yeah. like the pieces of legislation or if there's um, a vision behind it all. Well, there was. <laughs> and look, I think that, uh, first of all, I think when you talk about the Biden agenda, of course, uh, a lot of it's built on the Obama-Biden agenda. We were able to expand health care coverage to a record number of people because we had the Affordable Care Act to build on. Uh, we were able to pass sweeping climate change legislation because uh, we had the Paris Agreement that President Obama had worked on. So, uh, we, you know, we built on a foundation, but I think we took that foundation in two uh, new directions. Uh, the first is we face different problems than we faced in the Obama administration. 12 years is a long time. The country's changed. The world's changed. And so uh, we inherited a whole different problem set. And what did that lead to? I think that led to two things. One, a determination to uh, go big, to meet the moment. Uh, we inherited one of the worst economic situations since the Great Depression, the worst public health crisis since uh, Woodrow Wilson was president. And so we had to impose some very large solutions to deal with those very large problems. Uh, the climate crisis has gotten so much worse than 12 years ago. We're getting closer and closer to critical endpoints here. And so, again, larger solutions, more aggressive solutions. I think that's the first difference and the first big design element. The second is uh, we really put manufacturing and making it here in America at the centerpiece. And why? Well, I think partly that reflects uh, watching the past two years and seeing the difficulties with supply chains during the pandemics and how hard it was to bring things to this country, the inflation impact, so on and so forth. It also reflected a, a desire to really uh, just make things here in America, to bring back manufacturing as a critical component of the economy. So when you look at the CHIPS Act, which passed this summer, you look at the infl uh, infrastructure bill that passed last year and the Inflation Reduction Act, again, uh, last month, uh, we're talking about legislation that's really stimulating a revolution in American manufacturing and making things here in this country. Because it's interesting because most Democratic administrations kind of get judged on how they've expanded the social safety yeah. net. And it seems like you've been able to get Congress to pass trillions of dollars in, uh, you know, some of that goes to expanding the social safety net yeah. for sure. But a lot of it goes to kind of a different theory of the of, of how the state can be used to create change or to build uh, the economic Well, look, I, again, security. I think we, we had to address the problems that we found. Right. And the biggest problems that we found were a country with a pandemic that was killing, uh, you know, thousands, literally thousands of people a day, uh, hundreds of thousands of cases a day when we arrived. And so we had to ramp up the response to that. And then the economic consequences of that. Uh, it, it's easy to forget that when Joe Biden came to office, We'd turn on the TV at night, people were in line uh, in football stadiums waiting for a box of food. The unemployment rate was nearly 10%. We had 20 million people out, out of work and, uh, and businesses closed and schools closed. So we needed an economic response that addressed that. But the president also ran on a promise to build back better and to see that at the other end of getting over this immediate crisis, we'd build the kind of economy that he likes to say from the bottom up and the middle out that would really create good jobs and an economic future for everyone in this country, whether they went to college or not, uh, the kinds of jobs that people could raise a family on, and, and that would recenter American economic strength, not just in financial markets, not just as kind of a global trader of goods, but as a country that makes the critical elements of production. And, and I think, last thing I want to say on this, that is critical to the clean energy transition. 
I think if we're going to say we're going to make this country and we're going to increase uh, our reliance on solar power, our reliance on wind power, our reliance on electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging stations, making those things in this country so we have a reliable supply, we aren't uh, dependent on foreign imports of solar panels or windmills or uh, batteries for electric cars, I think it's critical to knowing that uh, new clean energy economy is going to be reliable and sustainable here in America. Did it feel like philosophically you were, t you were going in a different direction, just given the changes in globalization, given the, the role of the state that emerges from these pieces of, of legislation? Look, I think what we did is consistent with the philosophy that President Biden has had uh, for you know, his 40 years in public life, which is a fundamental belief that if you give people a chance, you, give the, you create the kind of economy where hardworking people can get jobs, can raise a family, can get ahead. That's the kind of country we want. This was not some fundamental realignment of relationships between the government and the private sector. This was just uh, putting in place the kinds of tools and opportunities that makes this country work for everyone. I wanted to ask uh, one question about um, inflation, just uh, what we're talking about kind of economic vision and the, kind of the very Biden-esque part of the economic agenda, which is that uh, when I was listening to Jay Powell yesterday kind of talk about um, uh, trying to engineer a soft landing and what it would mean for labor markets, I kept thinking about how Joe Biden talks about jobs and how jobs are essential for the dignity of individuals. Do you think that there's a risk that we get to a place where the medicine is worse than the disease? Or how does Joe Biden think about those trade-offs between jobs and, and inflation? Look, uh, we're very careful to not comment on the decisions of the Fed, the actions of the Fed. They're independent. They make their decisions. I think that's the right way to run the economy. I think that's the right way to bring inflation down. Uh, I will say we are determined to create jobs uh, and to keep the unemployment rate low and to make sure uh, that every American who wants a job can have one. We obviously right now have uh, the unemployment rate uh, near the lowest it's been in 50 years. Uh, we've created more jobs in the president's first two years than any administration in history. We're very proud of that record. We're going to continue to fight for that record. I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about the pandemic. One thing that's striking to me is I think you're maybe the only person I know in Washington who hasn't contracted COVID <laughs> in the course of the pandemic. And yeah. first of all, how did you do that? Um, <laughs> um, uh, second of all, um, uh, the president, I think, took some heat the other day for saying that the pandemic yeah. was over and it made it, people made it sound like he was ad-libbing those comments. Uh, is that a fair? Uh, well, no, sorry. look, well, first of all, um, I've been fortunate. I am, I am careful. I uh, mask up quite a bit and, uh, uh, and also have the benefit or liability of being uh, at work so much that I'm not really going out to a lot of restaurants or other places <laughs> like that. So. So uh, having no life is a good way to not have COVID, but it's not really like the official policy of the administration. Um, look, what the president said the other day uh, was, I think, clear if you look at his whole statement. Uh, the sentence after the pandemic is over is we have a lot of work to do on COVID. And I, and I think the, the gist of that was what we've been saying all along. We have uh, progressed on the pandemic to where it no longer controls our lives. This event is in person. That wasn't the case last year or the year before that. Uh, people are here, people are out, people are going to restaurants and movies and other places if they have the free time. And, and so we are living in a very different country than we were. And, and to that extent, uh, the kinds of what the, what the pandemic meant to us in 2020 is over and is behind us. Now, why is that? That is because we now have the tools uh, to manage and make COVID less dangerous for those people who take advantage of those tools. Uh, and there are three tools in particular. We have booster shots. Uh, we didn't have them a year ago. That's a, that, I mean, it's hard to imagine, but a year ago, there were no booster shots. Now we have them. Virtually no one who is fully boosted uh, winds up going to the hospital from, with COVID, okay? So that tool, by the way, they are free. They are widely available. You can go to covid.gov, find a place within five miles of your house where you can get one, most often without an appointment. Could not be easier. We have that. Secondly, we have tests. We did not have at-home tests uh, widely available, even commercially available, 14 months ago. That's another transformative uh, development. It allows you, if you think you have COVID, to find out if you have COVID 
and get treatment. I'll get to that in a second. Those tests, again, widely available, free. Third, we have treatments. Uh, Paxlovid in particular, which wasn't even available, except in very, very small supplies, as recently as seven months ago, wasn't available all a year ago. And, uh, and the statistics show clearly that even if you are not boosted, if you find out you have COVID soon enough and you get Paxlovid, which is free and widely available, you will not get seriously, gravely ill from COVID. So we have, just in the past year, kind of changed the dimension of uh, attacking the pandemic. Now, that doesn't mean that COVID is gone. Of course it isn't. But it does mean that um, this is a very, very different disease. It, sadly, we still have 400 people a day dying from this disease. Virtually every one of those deaths, virtually every one of those deaths could be prevented if the person uh, who passed away had gotten boosted, had gotten tested, and had taken packs. G given the politicization of the pandemic yeah. and the way that um, there's uh, half the country that is kind of now paranoid about yeah. any sort of government interventions. And given the way that the Republicans blocked the passage of the last COVID package, do you worry that if the, when the next pandemic comes, just given this politicization of disease, that we won't be able to respond in the same sort of way that we did last time? Well, first of all, it's, it's not half the country, but it is a quarter of the country. And, uh, and it's tragic that we have people. I mean, uh, when the pandemic first hit, and it became very divisive and political. People were like, well, it's divisive and political about these public health interventions, but when the vaccine gets here, surely everyone will take the vaccine. And then we got the vaccine, and all of a sudden the vaccine became divisive and political, and a lot of people didn't get vaccinated. And then, well, the boosters came. And now we even have people who you know, just will not get tested in time, don't find out they have the disease in time, they get to the hospital too late, they can't be helped, or they refuse to take Paxlovid or whatever. It, it's tragic, it's truly tragic. Um, we don't have to guess what will happen when the next epidemic comes here. It's already here. It's monkeypox. And um, it's obviously not the same kind of pandemic that COVID is in any way, shape, or form in terms of the scope and scale and, and size. Uh, but we have gone from a handful of cases to about 22,000 cases. Uh, and we have responded. We have gotten people vaccinated uh, more quickly than any country in the world. About 600,000 Americans have already been vaccinated. Uh, we are the first country in the world to use the experimental uh, T-pox treatment uh, and make it uh, available. Uh, and we have bent the curve already a bit on, on monkeypox. It is uh, coming down, uh, down about 50% in the past month or so. Uh, but it has been difficult to get funding uh, for the fight against monkeypox. It is still impossible for us to get more funding to fight against COVID. I mean, let's just make it, I'll make it just very simple. Uh, we acquired the capacity to, and we're shipping to anyone who wanted them, free COVID tests to your home. That doesn't seem very political to me. I mean, like Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, you want a COVID test, we'll ship it out. We had to stop that because Congress won't give us the money for postage. We have the tests, but no ability to ship them to people's homes. Now, how did that become political? How did that become divisive? Um, I don't know, but, uh, but, but uh, I do worry that we have, we, we have so many great scientists so many great public health officials, so many great people working away on these things, uh, and yet we can't really fund in a sustainable way the efforts to that's, fight these that's infectious kind of terrifying, diseases. Right? That that um, you know we did have a brief window with COVID where the nation was able to come together and was able to make tremendous investments in public health infrastructure. Yeah. Unfortunately, they were kind of a lot of those investments were fleeting investments, yeah. right? Just to deal with the problem in front of us. And we don't necessarily have a, a whole new set of infrastructure. Yeah. There's no equivalent to the way in which Department of Homeland Security was erected in the wake of 9-11. Yeah. And so we don't necessarily have the more, more, more robust implements emerging from yeah. this crisis. N not yet. We need to get there. Um, Midterms are coming up, which is I've something that could, that. Yeah. Yeah, could complicate your life in various ways, shapes, or form. Um, could you, I, I mean, I, I can imagine various ways in which your life is about, like, if, if things tip the wrong way, are about to get uh, quite hellish. But what, what, what worries you uh, about uh, how your life is going to change the most if yeah. uh, Republicans take power in? Well, first of all, I want to say I'm an executive branch official. I'm covered by the Hatch Act. I don't engage Intellectual the advocacy, Hatch Act defense. the Hatch Act defense, but the, trying to avoid one other form of, of trouble, which is getting in trouble with the Office of Special Counsel. Um, but uh, but what I want to 
what is clear to me is this, uh, without getting into election advocacy, the two parties, the Democrats in Congress, the Republicans in Congress, they stand for very, very different things. And the choice uh, just couldn't be clear. And the contrast couldn't be clear. And I think, obviously, one issue that this is front and center on is the issue of abortion and reproductive rights. Uh, the day the Dobbs decision came down, uh, President Biden said that this country was going to go one of two ways. We'd either pass a law to codify Roe versus Wade and make sure that every woman in this right, every woman in this country had the right to choose, or that eventually uh, the Republicans would get control of the House and Senate and pass a law to ban abortion. And we know what that looks like now. Senator Lindsey Graham came out with legislation to uh, not just ban abortion, by the way, but to impose a f up to a five-year criminal penalty on doctors who provide reproductive services to women. And I just want you to think about what kind of country this would be if doctors walked around knowing that they could go to jail for five years for providing needed services to their female patients. Uh, who, who will go in, who will go into that profession? Who will provide those kinds of services? Who's willing to risk a prison term? I mean, there surely will be some brave doctors, I don't doubt that, but we will see an exodus from the medical profession. We will see uh, people just totally changing their practices if they know they are at risk of a five-year prison sentence. And what Senator Graham has said is that if the Republicans win the midterm elections, he will put that bill on the floor uh, and they will fight for that bill. And we, we will see doctors at risk of those kinds of prison sentences. So I think, uh, I, I don't worry so much about me or us at the White House or whatever. I worry about the, the sharp divide we have now in this country between Democrats and Congress and the agenda they are pushing and the kind of extreme agenda we see uh, Republicans pushing on these issues uh, like abortion, like putting Social Security and Medicare on the chopping block every five years. You know, I could go on and on. But th this is a very wide difference uh, that we have in our country right now. Could the politics of Ukraine shift? Could the politics of Ukraine shift? Look, I think so far, there's I mean, been, if, if Republicans yeah. are in. I mean, I'll, I want to be clear. I'm yeah. not going to engage in election hatched, advocacy, no but, yeah. but I, I do believe that Democrats will hold the House. I do believe that Democrats will hold the Senate. Uh, so this will not come to pass. But I will say on Ukraine, uh, we have been lucky, uh, fortunate to have uh, bipartisan support for the things we've done on Ukraine uh, and strong bipartisan support. It's an issue that has not been divisive, and I hope uh, that will continue uh, uh, next year uh, under, once again, a Democratic Senate and Democratic House. I want to just take uh, the last bit of time I have with you to reflect kind of big picture about the president himself. Yeah. I mean, you've known him for a very long time. Um, how has he changed since he was vice president? And have you seen him? I mean, I know, uh, uh, you know, he's been around for a long time. He's almost treated like he's a piece of kind of the furniture. And so we don't necessarily think about him. He is definitely not treated like a piece of the okay. furniture. Okay. <laughs> good, good to know. But how, how has he changed? And how has he, has he changed at all since he's become president? Well, I, I, I first went to work for Joe Biden 36 years ago. And uh, the person uh, that I went to work for 36 years ago is the same person who's president today. He has the same core values, the same core beliefs, fighting for the same things. Uh, but I obviously think there are uh, responsibilities that you have as president, that you have no other job in our government, not even as vice president. He is the final decider on whether or not we're going to send our troops in harm's way. He is the final decider on what legislation we're going to push forward or not. And uh, and, I, and, and particularly the period right around the start of the Ukraine war, uh, where he went out publicly and said, hey, Vladimir Putin is going to invade Ukraine at a time when most of our allies did not believe that would happen. And he really put himself out there and his credibility and his reputation and his international leadership out there. Uh, you know, th those are the kinds of decisions and responsibilities he has to have as president that you don't even have as vice president. And I think, um, uh, you know, that definitely is something he carries around. It's definitely something that uh, weighs on him every day. Um, uh, but what I would say, you know, at, at what I've said before about him is, um, you know, he is a man who's gone through great tragedy in his life, as everyone knows, in his personal life. And what I know is when I walk into the Oval Office every morning, there is nothing I can say to him that's worse than things that have already been said to him already. There's no news I can give him that is sadder than news he has already gotten in his life. And I think that gives him an equanimity 
and a, a poise and a balance in the job uh, that serves him very well as president. When he talked in that 60 Minutes interview about 2024, which his answer was um, uh, left a little bit of a hedge in it, uh, is it what, what would stop him from running for re-election again? Well, uh, you know, as he said, he intends to run, and uh, that's kind of the formulation he has to give uh, to not, like, trigger federal election law and require us to file a bunch of forms and wh whatever. Um, uh, that is definitely his intention. Uh, obviously, something could happen. Uh, as he said, he's a, he's a believer in fate. You know, he's seen all kinds of things in his life, so he's not going to say where he'll be in December today. He respects the fact that a lot of things can happen. But it is his intention to run, uh, and uh, I, I believe he will run. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate okay, it. Okay, appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.